they have not acknowledged those who came before them. It is though hip hop began in the Browns. It did not begin in the Browns, and a lot of this music did not begin here. They have been the benefit of those who came before them, which they've made their contribution also. But they're not the, um, in no way are they the founders of it. As the 1960s comes to a close, Vietnam War vets are coming home. Unemployment is at an all-time high. Sanitation workers and teachers are on strike. The city is on the brink of bankruptcy. The hard economic times are visible throughout the city. A new generation responds to the harsh times in a different way. A beat could be felt through the five boroughs and the urban youth began to work the vibes of the city in its own way. This phenomenon, which will later on be called hip-hop, will go worldwide and transform itself into a billion-dollar industry. Rarely do we hear who set up the foundation from which others would build from and borrow from. Who were the founding fathers? King Charles. Grandmaster Flowers. New Sounds. Pete DJ Jones. DJ Hollywood. Grandmaster Flowers. Daddy Gasmaster. Disco Twins. New Sounds. Fame Machine. DJ Lance, known as Master D. Like, I never knew a cool hurt. In my days, I heard of Charisma Funk, Grandmaster Flowers, these guys had sound systems, DJ App. I never heard of a hurt. I'm not dissing hurt, but I'm saying every borough has their thing. When you take a, um, Grandmaster Flash and so many others, he's not the first, first Grandmaster. He stole the name from Grandmaster Flowers, yes. the original Grandmaster. I didn't get to hear, like, Grandmaster Flash until uh, when I started going uptown and DJing at the Renaissance Ballroom. Then we was doing it with, with Master D and Fresh Gordon was on the beat. But I mean, mind you, everybody was talking that uptown, uptown, but you didn't, nobody knew that Brooklyn was doing it. We was already doing it, oh, you know yeah. what I mean? So oh, yeah. a lot of things that, that, that came across uptown that you know that they want to take knowledge for it. Now nah, we was doing it. Yo, ask Melly yeah, Mel and them about right, Fantasia. Exactly. Ask Melly Mel, ask Grandmaster Flash about Fantasia. Ask them, they'll tell you when they came to Queens, where they came to. Fantasia, La Chalette, so right here, sweet, South man. Jamaica, man. They first out in the Bronx, man, this, this, thing, this thing was ugly in Brooklyn. Yes, yeah. sir. Rapping in clubs uh, in Manhattan, uh, before it was even fashionable. Pegasus, right, uh, right, right. Uh, Tribeca's. Uh, with guys like Grandmaster Flowers, Charisma Funk. That's right, Brooklyn was doing that. And um, Brooklyn was doing their thing. Brooklyn and as um, far as I knew, we were the only people doing it back then. Things I'm talking about right here, Fab Five Freddy, I'm talking about the era beef that inspired the DJs that created hip hop. I'm talking these is cats that made it hot, that made you want to be a DJ, that made Herc want to give part, made Flash, and like all them cats would tell you, like, these was the cats that really put it down, and it was, it was cast from Brooklyn, it was obviously it was cast from Queens. Yeah, he, yeah, he the cold of swing. It's just about ready to do that thing. I don't want no tears, I don't want no lies. But all, I don't want no alibis. This judge is hip, and that ain't all. He'll give you time if you're big or small. Fall in line with this cold as me. Peace, brother. Love. Here come the judge. Studied history.
first person to scat was Louis Armstrong. When you hear Rapper's Delight, it almost sounds as if they're giving a tribute to Louis Armstrong. I'll guarantee that you'll never see like the likes of them again. Mm, stomp your feet to the beat of my Dixie music men. Everybody move, get right in the groove. There ain't nothing you can lose. Now right here's the spot where we'll all get hot. With a nasty mess of blues. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. Um, this was heavily, it's not relevant to anything happening at a party. It's actually a tribute to uh, Malcolm X's uh, Field Negro, uh, House Negro Field Negro speech, in which he talks about when a, uh, when a field negro sees a fire, he wants the house to burn. He welcomes the wind, he wants the house to burn down. And the house negro always looked out for his master. When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. But then you had some field negroes who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. If the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. One chant in particular that I heard a lot of, which you, you see how relevant it is to the hip-hop generation, they would do this chant, um, hold your head up high, panthers walking by. We're going to clean out your ears, we're going to open your eyes. Um, and when in early rapping, you, you frequently heard it's almost like a mandate that you had to say, dip, dip, die, so socialize, you clean out your ears, and then you open your eyes. Um, and you know, this is this is like a panther chant. Uh, also of interest is that when you say "Dibby Dibby dies," you, you that's also a uh, um, uh, Louis Armstrong type of scat. <laughs> so in a, in, in in a way, you're tying in both Malcolm X and Louis Armstrong. Yes, just come on, brothers, if you want to hear a story about that preacher and the bear. Gather round, boys, I don't want you to miss none of this here story, because it goes like this. A preacher, he went out to hunt. It was on one Sunday morning. Though he was one Christian young man, but he took his gun along. Well, the first thing he shot was a bunch of fine quails, and he shot him a nice fat hare. Then through the woods on his way back home, he met a great big grizzly bear. Frankie Crocker was a, 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 a super humongous giant. And I think like, I remember like he, a lot of those DJs, he, they would be advertising their parties on WBLS back then. You know, I'm talking like in the 70s or whatever. And um, it just it was all a part of what made people want to be DJs, uh, have that dude to get on the mic, to really just talk about the DJ. He would maybe say, throw your hands in the air, wave him like you just don't care, things like that. We hooked up with a guy named KC, Prince of Soul. And KC was a master MC. First MC I can remember was KC, the Prince of Soul, in the 70s. Well, yeah. He was rapping for 1970. Wow. 1970. It, it could have been before then. One of the first that ever rapped to the beat of music. One of the first that ever did it. Run right about here, we're gonna let all hell break loose as we turn off the juice. Cause we're gonna take you up the ladder to the roof where we can see everything much better. From land to the sky on a natural high. So I want you to fly, fly, fly. Shake your head and wiggle your thighs. I wanna see a pack. And yet Hank Spam. And that's who KC, the Prince of Soul, tried to fashion himself after Hank Spam from WWRL. And Hank used to say, put your foot on the rock, pat it, and don't you dare stop now. This is Hank Spann willing and dealing from now until. WWRL. Mm. Hank Spann, put your foot on the rock, pat it, and don't you dare stop. And everything Hank Spann would say, I would write it down. And I'd get my tape recorder, and I would sit down and imitate Hank Spann. Put your foot on the rock, and that's your foot, don't stop. Put your foot on the rock. Put your foot on the rock, cause that's your foot, don't stop. Put your foot on the rock. And the radio was playing, and, I, and I'm sitting there, and then I, I hear the guy, you know, he's rapping on the radio, and I'm like, I could do that. So then I started, <clears throat> if I was a jug of wine, I would be old. If I was snow, I would be cold. But since none of this is true, and I'm right here with you, passing the time, doing what we gotta do. First people just started talking on the mic, and he was one of them, you know, but they didn't have the full rhythm and didn't turn it over. But if you remember, it was the same music. All they did was do the voiceover, copy the music. 
Yes, indeed, y'all, it's about that time to take you one step higher, set your natural bond, but right on fire. You're jamming back with the sounds of new sounds, hit a foot, walk right in your stride, one dip in your hip, make your knees freeze, you'll never quiver, crack on your back, and if you can't dig that mess, you got to be at the wrong address, because while everybody's laughing and joking, new sounds will be right here, cooking and smoking. And, and, and that's where the rap started from, and it picked up from there. But it was the same exact music we were playing, and somebody got up there and started talking to us. Let's go to work. Come on! Let's go to work. Get the bone out your back, boy, everybody. Get the bone out your back, girl. Now, I started doing that by saying, when I say this, you say that. Then it, be, it went into a whole nother era, and then, it be, and then everybody would say to the hip, the hop, the hip, it, 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 you know, everybody said that, and that's why I became known as hip hop. <laughs> It just keeps the same old me. About a while ago, and I want you to know just who you've been listening to. I am the voice of King Tim the Third. Tell you what I want you to do. A little left hand, right hand in the air, and you swing like you just don't care. You put your left leg out, the right leg in, say the hustlers out in the rock is it? About a Master Flowers was a Brooklyn DJ that was known as the Mixologist. He played from the late 1960s to the late 1970s in the parks of Brooklyn and eventually made it to the clubs downtown. He's also noted to be the first Grandmaster. Came from the Farragut Project, 237 Nassau Street. He started playing music in the 60s when he was in junior high school. He started out in a club down on Flatbush Avenue, 243 Club, which was down by Flatbush and Myrtle. I worked with him in the early 70s, okay. but he was doing it much before that. Okay. And I have the documented proof with flyers to show you. One night we were playing at a club called The New World, and one of the promoters there uh, had drawn up a flyer, and he put music by Flowers, The Wizard of Oz. And I took the flyer home, I reworked it, I bought it back, and I named him the Grand Master Flowers because of the type of music that he played. On West Indian Parade Day, Labor Day, he used to be the only one in Washington Park oh, playing club music, the mixologist. He went up against these West Indians, they was called Starlight Disco, I think. Starlight Disco, and then they had the parade going on, and Flowers just plugged his stuff up and started playing. Tore the whole crowd of everybody that was American came over to, to his side of the park, and and that's when I knew he was a tremendous dude, man. Flowers was so popular just in Brooklyn and Manhattan, his flyer would be on four or five flyers the same night, and he could not be there. He knew how to put music together and how to keep a crowd on the floor. I've seen a lot of DJs play the same music that he's played, but they can never hold the crowd. I used to always go to all his parties back in the 70s. Every Sunday, we used to go to Reese Park. Right, and we Reese. used to be there all from the day Park. until the day in. When I was in Brooklyn, I used to go to Reese Beach with my uncle. And they would have jams outside. Grandmaster Flowers was the, 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 the main DJ out there on the beach. You know, you'd have other DJs that was out there. Keith DJ Jones and all the other DJs would be out there. But the cats from Brooklyn, you know, it was like flowers is gonna be there, you know, so we're like, okay, that's gonna be hot. In 1974-1975, there was a big gang fight out there, and uh, that's when the, the federal government took over Reese Beach, and they just stopped the music altogether. It was amongst the first to create a thirst for unique records that nobody else had. Rumor has it, he was the first one to break the song, so Makosa in the United States before the radio stations even had it. The Flowers just played, you know, like just records that you never heard before. To this day, some records I never I never could ever find. Everyone was used to playing A-sides, and Flowers would go to the B-sides. 
but a lot of the newer music that Flower was played, no one else was able to get. When you heard records, you really wasn't hearing these records nowhere else before. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the records that any of these DJs played. And I'm talking about the Pete DJ Jones yes, people. I'm talking about Plumber, my boy. I'm talking about Flowers, the original Grandmaster Flash. That's where Grandmaster Flash got his Grandmaster from. Grandmaster Flowers, a Brooklyn cat. Flowers, his sister, we, they were still his speakers, still his equipment. We would sleep in his van sometimes. So they went and take his equipment so he could play the next day. It was back in, the, I think it was the early, late 80s or 90s. Um, I'm not sure of the date. Uh, I found out that uh, the Grand Master had passed away. You know, even now that I think of it, it's it still, uh, you know, I lost a friend. I lost a good friend. Uh, to be so close to somebody and uh, just to lose him like that. But uh, he's the Grand Master. And uh, long live you, brother, wherever you are. As far as his name, Grandmaster Flash, you're not the Grandmaster. I'll give you the respect, but you're not a Grandmaster. There's only one, and he's gone. By 1972, New Sounds was a group out of East Elmhurst, Queens, known throughout the city and various clubs for their exceptionally fluid mixes. Honing their skills at 127 Park, aka Bootyland, in the early 1970s, they set the standard that many patterned themselves after. With JD and Greg Love on the mic, New Sounds was a force to be reckoned with. Ricky had his own style, and then he had a big sound system to back him up. One of the biggest sound systems, you know, at at that age when I was growing up, I said, "Man, this guy." The ingenuity of new sounds was well known through the DJ circle. Ricky Grant was, him and his brother both was like super genius, especially Ricky in mathematics, geometry. I remember the first time we had a battle with him in St. Gabriel's. He built four base bottoms in St. Gabriel's. When a highly anticipated movie came out in 1974 called Earthquake, it boasted of its new technology with sensor around speakers. New Sounds engineers were able to rebuild the speakers to the same specs and the term earthquake speakers came into effect. The equipment we had, the speakers, were probably the best in the city and they were hand built by us. You know, we put the money up, we bought the tools and uh, we actually um, got some books and we worked out the formulas and built the speakers to specs and we had um, industrial um, Sherwin Vegas earthquake speakers. We had the power, you know, when we said that we had over 5,000 watts of power pushing our system, that was no exaggeration. The, um, the mid-range speakers were JBL's 15 and, and 12 inches, and uh, the mid-bass was Gauss, and the low bass was the Sherwin Vega earthquakes. The dampening factor was adjustable. Ricky Grant was the first one to do to take a Sony MX-14 mixer and take channels 1 and 2, 3 and 4, and so you control each volume from the turntable. Then from that, he figured out how to wide jack it so you can just go from instead of 2 to 1. And then from that, slick-ass engineers at GLI saw the idea, copied it, came out with the first 3800. They stole ideas from Ricky Grant. Once very dedicated to playing music in the parks, which they made a very popular thing to do in Queens, the group moved on to the club scene in the latter part of the 1970s. We had like a couple of people dance on top of the speakers. of people falling off because it got so crowded, you know. They had to stop the music and tell the crowd to please get off the speakers. Listen, I asked y'all not to stand on top of them cabinets. Now, I'm not going to ask you no goddamn more. In fact, out of this area, I don't want y'all inside here. Sitting on the speakers, back here, out, please. <laughs> you know, because that's how huge they were. New Sounds are uh, branched off into having their own label. New sounds. Let me see. 
Yep. New sounds. New sounds. You know, helping other local brothers and sisters and get albums, get put their music together and put it on wax as they say. You know, but that was the big thing. <laughs> Due the importance of a great sound system to draw a crowd and build a name was every DJ's goal. It was Queen's DJ Don, the dance master, known for his Richard Long sound system. One of the nicest guys had to be Donny Long's dance master. He was, he was like so special, you know, he had a sound system that was so ahead of everybody, so he outclassed everybody at one time, you know. So I enjoyed working with him because when you put his picture on a flyer, you put his name on a flyer, you drew a certain kind of crowd with him. You drew a real, really nice crowd. You didn't draw the knuckleheads. So I enjoyed working with Donnie Dance Master for that reason. Richard Long built the sound systems for Studio 54, the loft, and the garage, just to name a few. Donnie acquired the mobile version and blew everyone away. One of the first DJs that came out with a full system that um, was the most high fidelity system I've ever heard happened to be Dance Master. The Dance Master, one of the first guys who had a complete GLI sound system and from that went to the legendary Richard Long. One day he just showed up with this Richard Long system and our jaws just dropped because until then everyone was buying pieces of systems and making and amassing their system. The Dance Master speakers were called Berthas. They were so powerful they could be heard from blocks away. The first guy to have Berthas and all the, every other type of incredible sound speaker Richard Long could make. Very clean, very efficient. And that was the systems that were being used in places like Studio 54, uh, the garage, a few of the other major clubs, regimes. Um, basically, he came up with the first mobile version of that system. Richard Long owned the patent to the turntable coffin. He was the one who invented the coffin. And the first person that had a mobile coffin was Dance Master That's and the right. Disco Twins. And it was a Richard Long, weighed a ton, need 10 people to lift the coffin. 1979 to 1980, we seen Donnie Lawrence with his Richard Long sound system, which was called the Bertha. And he was, I think he was the first one to have a, a console deck. Well, the console was, was, looked like a coffin. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was very different. And he was able to come out in the park, five minutes, he was plugged in, turned on, and playing. I would play on the, on the weekends and a uh, big crowd would turn out. Folks would come, sell hot dogs the ice cream and you know you know you have uh, parents who bring the kids and we are very lot to turn out of. He used to play right there right? every time he could right there in the softball field in the sun records used to walk we used to sit out there and laugh at him and we say when you know we, me and Falk used to say <laughs> you know he's gonna be good because he's here every week practicing playing in front of everybody and every week, the sound got better and better. And like I said, he was the first one playing in major clubs, just bringing his records and getting paid for it. So don't believe none of the crap you hear about this one and that one, making money spinning. He was the first one spinning out of the country, making money. Before becoming a full-time DJ, I, I, I did guest, played as a guest DJ at Studio 54, Lake Club, El Morocco, Paradise Garage, Silver Palace. I would be allowed to record pool and I would get records that none of the DJs could get because I believe most of these DJs would probably purchase the records then. It was uh, whereas I would get records in advance that were promotional copies. Danny didn't spend too long out in the mobile world because um, of the fact that he had a Richard Long system and had some connections on that end. He went off in Regines, and Regines was like the revered club. Aside from Studio 54, who's who in the world came to Regines?
As the years go by, the equipment gets better. Bell Drive becomes direct drive turntables. The thing about it in those days, you, you only had seven inch 45s. And right. It had a limited right. amount. So to play a five, six hour party, you were you stuck in the mud, right, man. So, right. so we had to figure out, you had to, yeah, had to be inventive, man. So that's when we started playing the grooves on the record. I learned how to read the grooves. I had me a flashlight, flashlight to shine on the groove, and I could almost hit the groove every time. Not on beat, but you know, chop it, chop it. Right. You had to look at the groove of the record, and that was where the funky beat was at, and you would put your needle on that part of the record and, and that funky beat would come on because the groove was so heavy. We never cued music. It was, a it was just putting a needle on, on a record and grabbing it where you thought it was about to begin and then mixing it in, but there was no cueing back then. Now, a lot of people saying that scratching was an art from Jump Street. It wasn't. Scratching was when you didn't have a cueing system, you keep scratching your records to cue it up. There was no such thing as a, a, a mixer. There was a such thing as a switch. The GLI mixer is invented. Now DJs could go from one record to another continuously. So we start playing to stretch out our music. Sometimes we play a record at the beginning and the middle, start it over again, play it at the end until we get, they get tired of it. And then you come with the next record. Keeping the crowd's energy hype becomes easy at this point because the 12-inch record is introduced with longer break parts. The DJs are able to extend the record, and songs are manipulated and mixed in various ways. And immediately they came out with a whole instrumental side and longer beats, longer break parts in the middle. It was a big album that, that spent at 40, 45 speed. And the first 12-inch they ever made it was called 10% of nothing, and it was by double exposure. All the DJs in the circle that I was in, Grandmaster Flowers, Plumber, even the Queen DJs, like New Sound and those guys, the guys that played around that time, they all did the same thing, played the beat part, the jump, had a jump part. It was known throughout the circle that's the jump part. Mixing records and getting the second record right on beat can now be mastered because of the new cueing system. And I seen a guy with the headphone. And I'm like, what's the headphone about? He said, he's listening to that track. While other tracks playing. I said, he's listening to the record before it comes on? He said, yeah, you know, that's how we do it. The music that was played in the parks, you didn't hear on the radio. This was a subculture. While the rest of the country was watching Soul Train, a culture of sound was being born in the streets of New York. The DJs had no idea what was about to happen. People start traveling outside their neighborhoods to park jams. Everybody's doing it. DJs are popping up all over the city. Key was learning how to mix Love is the Message. You can mix Love is the Message, the original, three minute version. Mix it from start to beginning back again. When no one knows it, then you know you're ready to play the party. Love is the love message. Is the message. Yeah. Yeah. Love, love is the message. message. You're always going to hear love is the message. You could count on that. There were certain joints like that you could count on. Love is the message. You know, it used to be known as the anthem in Brooklyn back then. But back in the days, it was just so fun to see the whole park crowded and just waiting for Lance to throw that one record to make everybody go, Ah! <laughs> During the late 1960s, King Charles acquires a sound system. In 
1868-69, King Charles came to Queens, East Elmhurst. Uh, lived at his aunt's house. Then he just had a couple of speakers, really. After that, uh, he moved in a couple of years on 104th Street. And there, he started to build a system. Basically, even then, he was playing music for fun. King Charles had a powerhouse system, and he hired the best young, talented DJs in his neighborhood to help deliver his music. <laughs> King Charles. <laughs> This is the man, King Charles. He put me on. Falk, stupid ass Raymond, almost forgot about him. Raymond, if you see this in Florida, fuck you. I still love you though. Spent every dime. He should take his wife's money to buy fucking equipment. He was the first man to have crown amplifiers, the first man to have fucking a heavy ass Macintosh amp that weighed 150 pounds. At the end of the night, we used to draw straws who with two people would carry the fucking amp. Charlie had the system. Mm -hmm. And then he bring dominated every, everybody and everyone. Yeah. End of story. A deep bass abstract reggae rhythm was foreign at the time, but soon blended perfectly with the sound that was being created. Us as Americans didn't know. We, we didn't know where Charlie was. It didn't make a difference to us. No. We knew it was a different had an accent. We knew nothing about Jamaican or whatever the case may be. But see, now it all comes now. Now that 30 years later, now it comes. He came from Jamaica. Now we know why he got yeah, those so L48s bass. and had all that bass. See, if we would have known about Jamaican and Jamaican music over here in those days, and we were familiar back in the 70s, then we would have been, we would have said, okay, this yeah. is what we couldn't under comprehend. Jamaicans have always, bass is the foundation of all music, and we vibe on that very heavily. Only thing we know is one day, we're at 127 Park, and here come, here come Charlie, and behind him is everybody. We're like, what are those? Oh, man, that's just something I picked up, man. Oh. It's that L48s, man. You know, L48s. Everybody looking, what the hell are L48s? These big, giant cabinets like this and like this. We don't know what the hell these things are. And then, then the B36s that he used for oh, bass, man, everybody crazy. else used those just for bass. Yeah. He comes in with those, everybody's like, what are you doing? Reminiscing his earlier days in Jamaica West Indies. From studying his idol, King Tubby, he adopts the same style of music and brings it to America. I really come from this guy named King Tubby in Jamaica. He got this song, you know, every week, strictly every week. He's the one that, you know, he's been on the fire and things like that. The first guy to put me on the reggae music used to say, here, play this record. Here, play this record behind us. He used to hand me records that I never even heard before. We'd be at a party, yo, play this record. I used to blend them in perfectly. Reggae music. Music that you hear now that's, you know, that really trash. He had record from Yellow Man. Zumbo, zumbo, bo, zumbo, zen. Zumbo, zumbo, bo, zumbo, zen. Say if you have a pepper, you must have a banner. And if you have a... In my opinion, the DJ was a star before the rapper. The DJ was responsible for all this equipment and music coming out. Uh, and a lot of times, it wasn't necessarily the guy who was the, the baddest DJ. You know, uh, you know, the baddest, the baddest DJ was the guy who could marshal all of this equipment and all of this force and this power. Now, King Charles, who was who was the, a heavy hitter in our neighborhood in Queens, uh, could he even cut it all? I mean, this he must. I think he was terrible. You know, but that wasn't the point. The point was he could marshal all this, and he would have young bucks. Young bucks would come in there. Yeah, man, cut the record. He was a Jamaican guy. Yeah, man, cut the record. I'll smoke and do all type of thing, yeah, man. Yeah, nah. yeah, man, go ahead, man. Yeah, man. Blah 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 blah. blah. All this. Now. King Charles uh, again stayed mobile for many years, doing with youth centers, etc. And then myself, I morphed off into working with the band Fragile Package and going my way towards sound and engineering and uh, Vernon stayed doing DJing. Many great DJs who would later shine in hip hop were influenced by Pete DJ Jones as his equipment skill and connection with the audience set the standard for early DJs. Girl, you need a change of mind. Uh, 
got the jab, uh, Hennessy, Mikey Crocker, Ken, Webb, Gary Bird, all those guys. So I used to try to play DJ. And I, I get me one of those integrated amplifiers, figure out a way to put a mic into it. And I play music and, uh, and announce the record as I put it on. I got my first job downtown. Pub Theatrical. Yeah. I rocked the house so good, I got a phone call from this guy, my dick. And ever since then, we've been like this. That's this is the guy that made me. Made me New York number one. All it is is a word if you say it enough. Pete DJ Jones was the first DJ I ever saw. He motivated me and inspired me to become a DJ. And that's how I got started in the business. You know, I started as a, a DJ. And, and, and following him around everywhere he went, I was there. I was a, a Pete DJ Jones clone. The reason why I used Pete so often was the fact that Pete was always on time. If there's one thing that you can trust, I could stay in the bed. No matter where I was, I knew that Pete would be there. The brother, okay, had bow speakers. What he told me, DJs with some little small bows. When you left the party, you were soaking wet. He was known throughout the city before mixes were able to transition music quickly from one turntable to another. He's the first cat I ever saw use an echo chamber. Pete DJ Jones, 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 Jones. The Echo Plex. He would play at different clubs in the Bronx, Harlem, Midtown downtown, as well as local beaches and parks with great recognition. Back in 72, as I remember, there was like maybe five big DJs. You had Pete DJ Jones, you had Maboya, Smith Brothers, and The Plumber. When I first saw him, I was 13 years old, <laughs> and, and they let me in the club. I had a phony ID too. I went down to 42nd, got one of them IDs that said I was 21. So I went and checked them out at Nemo's and, and, and McCoy's and Nell Gwyn's and Pippin's and Superstar Cafeteria and, and, and all them spots, man. In 1971, I won DJ of the Year at the Martin Luther King Pavilion. Uh, we had a battle, had about five, about six, seven DJs. In 72, I was presented the uh, DJ of the Year Award at the Hilton. Across from Madison Square Garden, no, the Sheridan, okay. downtown Sheridan, yeah, right. 30, 30. by Melba Moore. Really? Uh, yeah, in 1973, at Bonnie Google's, I was awarded DJ of the Year by uh, Faith, Hope, and Charity and uh, Crown Height Affair. Well, I played until I, I, I had burnt out around 1976. I decided to buy the same club that got to rent me the club for my first night. I bought the club from him. Wow. And I spent most of my time trying to promote my own club. I did that, and then I bought a club called P and P, be on Jerome Avenue. And after that, I got tired of clubs. I decided to go go back into it. when I got a job teaching school. Gave up all my clubs, and I started DJing again around '84. But in the meantime, you had a million different DJs out there claiming they started this and they started that. <laughs> father, DJ Hollywood, was the DJ and MC all rolled into one. Harlem's own, landed work at clubs all over, but settled in at Club 371 in the Bronx. DJ Hollywood, number one DJ, started the game as far as I know. The biggest and made, most major influence I had was DJ Hollywood. Um, primarily be, because of his showmanship and the style and charisma that he brought to his performance. I was his disco son before there was a DJ run and a Curtis Blow. People used to call me the Hollywood dancer. I was like the best dancer in my neighborhood. I remember back when I was a kid, uh, my mother used to have card games on the weekend. They'd be like in a serious mode of gambling and my mother say, boy, put some records on the, on the thing, you know, let us play, play some records. So I get the 45s and I put the records on. When a good record play, everybody at the car table was like, yeah, oh, you know, and I was like, okay. When I played something that wasn't good, my mother was like, boy, why did you play that? So at a young age, I was <clears throat> introduced to 
plain flavors. Early in the game, the business of playing music was selling drinks. So I, I, I knew how to play drinking music. I knew how to play a record that'll make us say, oh, oh, hey, yo, give me another one of those. First time I seen him was at a Whispers concert at the Apollo Theater. It, it changed my life, because I seen, I seen him and I was just awestruck at the command that he had over the entire crowd. In the Apollo, they never had dancing in the aisle and all that. This was like, you come, you sit down, you see the show, you enjoy the show, and, and then you go home. Man, I had them dancing in the aisle. <laughs> I had them dancing all over everything. People was crazy. And uh, most of the people that came, they didn't know what Hollywood was. They had no idea of what I was about. So this is their first time ever really seeing the DJ go at it. I, they got little little uh, balcony seats up like this here. I had uh, I had like three people on this side and three people on that side, and I had like four people out in the audience that knew my stuff. When I started rocking it and I'm throwing it, come on, let's go to work. Everybody that's sitting is like, now people are starting to feel it. Uh, the guy who owned the Apollo's name was Guy Fisher. He, uh, he said, man, this is good, man. I said, well, how good is it, man? I don't see my name on the marquee. He said, you want to see your name on the marquee? When they had a, a show with like, like three groups on it that take up the whole marquee, he put my name right there. Man, did I feel big. Did I feel big. Many early rap phrases such as, throw your hands in the air, and somebody say ho, or said to be originated by DJ Hollywood. Things uh, said that I own. <laughs> that I don't have copyrights for. Every MC, no matter how good he is, had to go and to throw your hands in the air. Uh, somebody say ho. These are the type of situations that I stumbled across on my way through just by people responding to what I'm saying. Saying that brings me to the point of, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And everything after that, is what you hear now. Hollywood's famous call and response still amps crowds to this day. By 1975, park DJs were competing hard with each other as more and more DJs joined in. Like in any sport, there's always some type of competition. There's o you always have to. You always want to be up over the, the next man. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, everybody had their little their little thing. Disco Twins, you know, us, uh, you know, East Elmhurst, Corona, Queensbridge. You know, Brooklyn was into sound systems and... The records you had, Uptown was into MCs and step shows. Um, the Bronx was into having records before the other crews had records and spraying them out. And Queens was into the echo chamber and 50 million speakers. So Brooklyn used to really compete with Queens a lot. Who had a better system? Who who just got the a better turntable, better amplifier, better speaker? You know, I just got this, I got that. I got this record first. Who's spinning there? It was about what DJ was spinning. It really wasn't even about an MCV. It was about, yo, who's playing them records? Because you know his sound system was right. And that's the other thing, once again, about Brooklyn and Queens cast. The sound system was super clear, Great. powerful. Like, that was really the foundation of everything. Just the way the speakers would be stacked up, man. It would be like worshiping at an altar, baby. You know, to feel that bass and hear them incredible records. At that particular time, the DJs were into loud speakers, jumbo, gigantic speakers, speakers that you see in Madison Square Gardens. You had Jamaica sounds, you had Cypher sounds, you had solo sounds, Davey DMX. I mean, we were strong with that sound set, same as it was in Jamaica. Like, in Jamaica West Indies, the DJ was the prevalent force. Okay. For us, the DJ was serious. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be like new sounds. 
So it's about equipment, practice, Risley spinning on the first turntable, Pioneer PL12D belt drive. First turntable with an S tone on, not a technique. Technique came out two years later. SL1200, first version. The first one, even before the Pioneer, was some type of plastic type from um, Radio Shack. It rocked. They, they were good turntables, but they were belt driven, and a right. belt drive turntable is not good for mixing. Right, you can't okay, it's, adjust it's better, the speed in any kind of way. It's better, with direct drive is, will, it's a better mixing turntable. You can, it's better for scratchers, better for everybody, because yeah. it, it's the way you pick up, pick up is much quicker, and the drag is less. Those are Gerard turntable, that's a GLI 3300. Yeah, mixer. Okay. And I was the only DJ in New York that played with his turntable side, side by side. By side. Yeah. Ain't never seen nobody do that but me. Never well, seen nobody do that. Times were very tough to mix and uh, it was uh, it really gave you a challenge because they had the rubber bands and we figured if you could mix on those you'd become like a pro. Then I tried the uh, the 1100s and then it just became so easy uh, because they had these pitch controls it was just like a, like a breeze. The first turntable I ever used was a SL23 by Technique, was a belt-driven turntable. The DJs of today have a, a real big advantage in regards to the equipment that they're using now because back in the days when we first started, I know I myself, I first started DJing on Technique D1s, which was like crazy to, to, uh, uh, to actually manipulate. 1500s. 1700s, 1800s. I used that 1800 until I later got onto them 1200 MK2s, which was probably the third version that they put out of 1200s, if nobody knew. At the stock nights, you know, you had a bullet tweeter uh, to uh, turn the sound with. Like with vibrates off the cars or something. The tweeters are actually the same as the professional tweeters. What they use them to is to detect traffic and, and control the lights. Everybody was stealing the bullets off the stoplight. Every stoplight in town, they had to put a cage over them, man. So everybody had about six bullets. Bang! Wow! Bang! Wow! I even when I got me a big EV horn from the subway station. So we used to go around through the neighborhoods to climb up the poles and take the tweeters down and use them. Actually one night I was climbing a pole like this and a cop car came by. The two cops, they stopped, they looked at me. Oh, what are you doing, climbing poles? I said, yeah, yeah. And they just kept going. Put it on a round board and attach it to a chain and we'll try to hoist it up. I would make that hissing sound. It would make a big difference in the sound and the music. Uh, the crowd would just go up. I remember going to 127 Park and seeing new sounds. Uh, actually, I went with my father. We were visiting a family relative or relative in, in Corona, and we went to see new sounds and just was impressed from what they were doing. It started about 1974. We got together, um, developed the name, took two Bose 901s from a home system and a receiver and a couple of turntables and a mixer and started uh, DJing and as time went on the group grew and so did the equipment as well. We really became um, active in about 1978 when the equipment started being able to handle outside park. Madison Square Garden. Crazy Eddie, who was the sole distributor of Sherwin Vega. Michael Goody's father went in there and bought $20,000 worth of Sherwin Vega equipment in one clip. 77, bought all that equipment for his son, went across the bridge to the Ford dealership, bought his son the brand new, at the time, Ford 77 Supervan, which no one had even seen, first year body style. Knowing to brag about how many watts they had, Infinity Machine was the real deal. This man here, Michael Goody, showed us what technology and electronics was all about because we was taking receivers and amplifiers and 
that's what power was all about when we was just piecing together sound systems. And Goody came out and showed us how a whole fucking system supposed to look. Most of the DJs like we hear now, we respect the Disco Twins and Ken Charles and all of them. But all things being for real, Cypher Sounds, Infinity Machine was making noise and throughout the whole Queens. We had Sir in Vegas, L48, <laughs> B36. That's what I and said. Infinity Machine, Divine and Infinity Machine. You talking about? You talking about thousands of people? I've been hearing stories that people was on Rockway Boulevard. We're talking about maybe four or five blocks past the highway. They used to say, yo, you hear that? Hear what? Oh, yeah. That sound like rain. No, that's a fitting machine and cypher sound in the park playing. Yeah, so they used to always come down there. Sufton Boulevard, you could hear it. Boom, boom, boom. Brooklyn's own Master D was able to keep his popularity from his early days of DJing to this day without interruption. see people like Master D from Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, Von K, Keithy B and all those cats, I would follow them from parks and projects and block parties throughout my neighborhood, you know, from, from LG to Albany, you know what I'm saying, like, 44 Park Soul in the Hole, you know, parties at Sumner Avenue Armory, where before it really was named, it was like a combination of like, you know, what, what was known as disco, but like just great music. Me and him had the same name. And I was like Grand Master D, he was Master D. Okay. His name was Lance, and Clem. Frankie D, yes, all of them. Yes, but yes, Lance sir. was Brooklyn to me. Me and him embraced each other. Right, and right. this was before Houdini. Of course. This is before of Houdini. Course, of course. And, and then I said, yo, this is what I want to do. We had many DJs on the street. You had Frankie D, you had Charisma Funk. I learned from the master right here. This is also known as the bass master in Brooklyn. Yes. Frankie D had the best bass in all of Brooklyn. You got to say this. I started with my little bass speakers and our little house, my Jensen speakers. Next thing I know it, I had Vegas. Next thing I know it, I had Berthas. And then as I was growing up, I kept remembering, there's a guy in Roosevelt. I don't know, he kept making noise. So he hung out with me one day, and next thing I know it, DJ Lance got on the map. But far as this rapping and and cutting and scratching, it was Master D, Vaughn K, and my crew, Keefe B. We we took the streets of Bed Stuy and most of Brooklyn. We was kind of like, how you say it? Ghetto Fabulous. Ghetto Fabulous you know I mean? stars in the hood. Yeah, hood yeah, fans. Sure. You know and accessible sure. hood stars, not the ones who have behind them, big gates and gated mansions now. Yeah, We're talking yeah. about they rap. And they hip hop. They was all these brothers here was all touchable, reachable. You saw them every day. We used to go to LG and play in the in, in two seventy Park, Tompkins Projects, Sumner Projects. You know, especially our home, Roosevelt. That's where everybody knew us from, Roosevelt Projects. Ask your moms or your auntie in the Mabai. It was out there shaking and wiggling to oh, the beats of man. Yeah, man. They knew what it was all about. Yeah. You know, my man yeah. got on that mic. This is Master D in the house. We knew what it was. You already know. I remember like yesterday, Lance playing in thousands of people in the park showing doing up. his thing. Just doing showing his up. Thing. I changed my name from Master D to DJ Lance because at one time I was switching over into this club era and I just felt it was best to be known as your for your real name. Just Mind you, up. when he made the when he made the change over to DJ Lance, it took a while because everybody knew him as Master, Master D. D. So when he switched up and said, yo, I'm about to take it to another level, Holla. <laughs> DJ Lance, we was we was lost. We was like, so what are you saying, man? You gotta move on. So he did what he did, he moved on.
Master D now DJ Lance retains his national recognition and involved with the changes in equipment, computers, and music. A skilled DJ that can keep him moving even three decades later. Master D was a beautiful run. It was beautiful. But right now as DJ Lance, I'm still playing 30 years down the line, and I'm playing heavy. I'm playing from Tuesdays to Sundays. I get one day off to relax. I'm traveling the world with different promoters, and I'm loving it. You still got it in them, man. You stay booked. You stay getting from, not just from borough to borough. I'm talking about DR, Aruba, stuff like that, man. You know what I mean? This man is everywhere. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Disco Airlines Flight 78. Our captain tells us we'll be flying very Out of the story of projects, the twins together with DJ Smalls and Sesame on the mic provided a jam not to be forgotten. Seattle? Well, it started off with a house party, and uh, we had a friend that had a guitar system, a guitar system used to play the guitar. His name is Michael Traps. And we asked him, could we use his amplifier? so we could do our party, and the party became a success, and we decided to try to take it to another level. Back in the days, these gentlemen had one of the top systems in the country, not in the city, not in the state, in the country. They had these speakers that was called birthers, and these guys would go everywhere with them birthers, hook them up, and take people out. Bertha is like a, a eight, two 18 inch speakers. I think it's this chair. It's like a 64 by 35 and a half. And they have extensions in the front that brings the speaker out look like a big giant horn. It's about 10 so, foot. Yeah, 10, so. 10 feet. You would have to go to one of the major clubs in the city to hear the sound system, the way it was projected back then. It was just so pronounced. It hits right in your chest and literally knock you to your knees. It's just <laughs> unreal. If you could just imagine stuff like Catch a Groove and this. Every time they would, it was like oh, all the in the sky. Like, you know, it, it, it was no joke, man. You know, I can't stop. It was like definite, you know, and you know, just to have two twin brothers and the routines they did. I think I'm one of the few, maybe five people who actually tell them apart back then. There was no one that could really compete with us back then. The rival we had was King Charles was one of the rivalries. Right. The other one was uh, Infinity the one, Machine. Infinity Machine. They're the only rivalries we had. Yeah they, were, yeah, they were the only ones. The twins made it entertaining by doing all sorts of tricks on the turntables, taking it to another level. The Disco Twin, Twin Brothers, was the first to run around turntables, to, to spin behind their back, do all type of stuff that, you know, that everybody thinks started with the executioners, uh, Q Burton, this, that, no, it didn't. It started right here in Queens. He used to get, he used to get on my shoulders and we used to do spin around the turntable, um, um, play backwards, play backwards. We did some feet stuff, our hands, those kind of little things. We was just doing that basically for entertainment. The Disco Twins mastered all aspects of the game from mixing, scratching, and promoting. Not only were they they're skillful on the turntables, but people that didn't know about the skills would just want to rent their system to have it so they could perform on it. I used to always pass through Disco Twins. They were so enormous. They were like a legend, you know what I'm saying? I mean, technically, the way they set up their system, the way they moved as a machine, um, the Twins, like business-wise, is something that people don't talk about. I mean, these brothers own like taxi cabs and Frank stands and real estate, so they move like such a machine. I used to always watch them. Plugging into the streetlights for power to boost park jams was a common scene in the five boroughs. DJs was mixing, scratching was just starting to happen, but uh, those were DJs that really set it off and made, you know, having a system, you know, having, you know, your speakers, your records and whatever, and just bringing that music into the streets. You know, that's that classic era of breaking, of breaking the whole, you know, breaking the street light open. Those were the days when uh, we didn't have generators. 
we would take a 100 foot extension cord and wrap it around a light pole and plug in and uh, it was light sound and music and dancing. It was crazy, there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people and we would jam for hours non-stop. I remember the first time I learned how to do that. You know, I watched somebody open up, you know, open up the, the little little panel on the bottom of the pole, and it was like there was a plug in there. We were like, why is why is that there? But you know, I guess it was when cats used to work on it or whatever like that. Work on the on the on the, on the light pole. We plugged it in, and boom, the power came on. We were like, what? You can't be can't, can't be serious. So once we fit, found out that that was going on, um, that was a that was a big experience for us, man. We 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 then you know knew that we could do, you know, jams outside, you know, anywhere and, and not have to worry about, you know, where the power was coming from. What I remember about that scene was, you know, just a lot of fun. It was, it was, you know, comparatively, comparatively brand new. Uh, you know, the, the park jams held a lot of promise each and every day. The, the DJs were the, the sound you could hear for blocks. You could hear it, you know, from from you know from my house on 31st Avenue. You know, you could hear what was going on on 25th Avenue. You know, or or vice versa. And 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 each it seemed like you know, on on the weekends in the summertime in particular, you know, there were park jams going on all around our neighborhood. They were all within walking distance. You could go to 127. You could go to 92 Park. You could go to 143. Uh, and you know, just to name a few. Uh, we used to always do all kind of things out here in 127 Park, blow out the street lights and, and just party, have no problems, no fights, no arguments, not anything whatsoever. We party, we had ourselves a good time. It was about the party, it was party. about the atmosphere, right. yeah. it was about it was about the love. We, it may sound corny to y'all, but we gotta come back to that. No harassment from the police, which on, at the time was only the 114 precinct. They said, let us play at 4 o'clock in the morning. They didn't care because they knew everybody was here. No problems. Like in my hood in Bed-Stuy, like the cops really would let you do your thing because you would have all the wolves, all the real aggressive teenage energy that would be out there causing drama, really, you know, partying and really being, being tame, you know what I'm saying, while you was enjoying that music and getting a chance to get at them neighborhood cutie pies and all that. Each borough was, was a, you know, an entity unto itself. I mean, it was like a whole nother world. When you were in the Bronx, you almost never left the Bronx. You know, that was kind of your world. Same thing with Brooklyn. It was so vast that, that you never really had a need to leave that area. Very rarely, if you, if you did at all. Queens was the same way. Master D, whenever that set was there, we was dead. There was no partying from Harlem and you coming down here and exactly. from Queens and you coming down. It wasn't none of that. And we was in your hood. We was in Queens. We Definitely. was in Harlem. We All was in, in the Bronx. This was real talk. Brooklyn was just like, you know, Planet of the Apes. You know, nobody ever, nobody wanted to go there. Nobody, you know, it was like, ah, you know. We didn't care where it was. As long as we could pull out our set and play, we didn't care about what, because they was going to end up loving us anyway. Back in the days, we had a little bit of a rivalry between King Charles, New Sounds, but we all had respect for one another. We, we were like we were so-called friends, but, but we also battled each other. Everybody wanted to know what was number, number one, so we would just come out there and, uh, you know, blast it out, see what could bring out the most crowd. We battled, but yes. we battled for publicity. We didn't battle because we didn't like each other, because we had love. That's what it was all about in Queens. Everybody in Queens, DJ, that was in that circle of Infinity Machine, we just knew each other and we just had love for each other. Bay Street, Sound Experience, Supreme Sound, Cypher Sound, all of us, we just had love and it was just a lot of love out here. Like the time Goody and them got squatted, the twins, up in the the twins had them had him crying outside IS-8. The twins came in there with two birthdays and, and four speakers on the pole, Richard Long, crushed them. 
Yeah. Goody coming out there. <laughs> first guy with a bald head, too. Not Michael Jordan, Michael Goody. <laughs> bald head. <laughs> Shaking his head. <laughs> like, I don't believe it. The Disco <laughs> Twins, yo. Fine, and then mind, not only did they crush them sound-wise, they did all that trick shit. Running yeah. around the turntable, yeah. spinning yeah. behind their back. We came to the IS-8 with six speakers. Two Berthas with LeVan and two Americanas and Ultimus. No, two Americanas and two Ultimus and eight ring radiators. And we came with two, one amp rack. They came into the gym bringing a load of speakers and they went home and got more speakers to come and try to take us out. They had L48s, V36s, B36s. Uh, um, they had no L, uh, 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 folded horns. And they had a whole bunch of rave uh, uh, speakers. We had a couple of things. I remember what I heard that the Berthas that the twins got, they went to Richard Long and, and they got them from him. They rented them to come to our party and, and battle us. And what we did was we in turn went out to Crazy Eddie's and we bought new equipment. <laughs> so it was the same thing. It was who did what. Y'all got to get that right. Y'all did not blow us away, and y'all only came with those little those 25 speakers. I'm not trying to diss y'all, whatever it is, but we was very efficient with what we have. But it was two against one. It was the twins against me. What happened? But you, you're my homeboys. I love y'all, man. I love y'all. The dance out there, the dances out there at the time, it was hustle. You know, the six-step hustle and variations of the hustle. <laughs> That was very popular. And then you had the freak. It was just where they jamming at. You know what I mean? Who's in the park? Yo, baby, where they at? Where they jamming at? Like, what what park are they in? You know what I mean? I can remember like being a shorty sitting on my stoop on Hancock Street on a hot, quiet summer night. And, and when it got just quiet enough, you could hear the bass from somebody's speakers like all the way in Albany Projects in St. John's Park or whatever. Be like, yo, yo, they jamming up there, y'all. Da, 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 da. The thing about it, each one of those park jams had its own dynamic and its own personality. You know, like, like the 7, 127 was kind of our thing. That was kind of like our home base. So we felt more comfortable there than anything else. We could go there early and play some ball, then go back, switch up, come back a little later with our fresh, you know, our fresh gear, whatever, you know what I mean? That was our home thing. If we were going to 143 and we were going to 92, a little different neighborhood, a little, little different concerns. We couldn't, we couldn't just, we couldn't go there completely with our guards down. You know, we had to, we had to go there with, a, with, with our minds right, to have fun, but also kind of be mindful. But, but the music is what, is what held us and is what, uh, you know, what really inspired us. It, the music was so powerful on, a, on, a, under, on us, that that's what allowed us to go into like enemy neighborhoods. You know what I mean? What, why else would we would we do that? You know, we because the, the music was there and the girls were there. Our competitiveness had a certain spirit to it. Like we would go to something called the Ave, which is Jamaica Avenue, 165th Street, Jamaica Avenue, the mall, and we get the belts from. You know, Mr. Lee's get the fresh sneakers. The co competition was like um, competing to have a good time. So it was almost like spirit energy. We rocked the ski hats different. We rocked the ski hats like straight up in the air. And you know, just like, you know, look like a big freaking hip hop pirate. I don't know what the hell he was doing. But it's like, you know, look like a big shark. My hat is like a shark fan, you know. You know, we're talking about a time period where people wear Converse and Pro Cats, where you could go to the supermarket and get your sneakers. You know, and they called them skips if you had something other than pro cares or converse. You know, that was a time period. And, you know, the, the, the short pants that, that brothers wore, they came down just above the knees. And they were kind of tight fitting. The t-shirt they see people wearing, what they call the wife beaters, they were popular back in the 70s. Probably see my man here on the left back in the day, the furry kango. Fat ass Playboys, the match. Back then we had Gaffer Playboys. Teams. We had Playboys, British Walkers, Mock Necks, Silver Medallions. Bring your dancing shoes out. You know, have that gear tight. Two piece tailor made for Moon. A lot of the niggas like Run DMC, oh, they was emulating us. The Lee suits, 
the Vaselino Velour hats that you saw, we was rocking them already before they was doing DVDs. Then when you seen it, you seen it on them. We had already made that alive. They took it, well, they, they took it and then they brought it out of the hood. That was that was really a South Jamaica kind of style. Now Brooklyn, they had the beavers with the the, the, the oil. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. They oh, had yeah. that oh, yeah. slick alligator look and shit like that. That's yeah. Brooklyn. But we had the Vaselino Velours, alpaca sweaters, the mock necks. You saw that the leather blazers. We was doing that. We was we wasn't playing, man. Jeff Harris was one of the first promoters to bring outside DJs to St. Gabriel's. He was the first one to bring Flowers, Maboya, The Plumber, to battle King Charles, New Sounds. Promoters, see, without the promoter, they don't get work. If they don't get work, they don't get known, they don't get exposed. So I, I work with, I used to promote Grandmaster Flash, Plumber, Riffin Cliff, Maboya, Pete DJ Jones, New Sounds, um, King Charles, Danny Dance Master, Disco Twins. These are the DJs that I, I constantly was promoting. Crown Heights Affair, The Dream in a Dream, um, BT Express, um, Double Exposure. Jeff, other than whoever's left as a black promoter, I think, uh, Sun Song Production, Al Heyman and them. Jeff used to get all the top notch acts that used to perform at St. Gabriel, basically a gigantic gym. What I would do, I would study the charts. When I hear new R&B group would come out, and and they had a hot single. I would I would go right to the booking agent, try to book that group, and I had success, and I would book the group. For example, Double Exposure came out, I had a record called My Love Is Free, hot, just kill them that record. for that group to come to St. Gabriel's Queens, right? But the record was hot, and the night that they performed, I mean, this, this north side of Queens had thousands of people, people, but we couldn't believe how many people came to that event. Big DJ, Baby J, New York City, Roseland, holding it down for 10 years. I feel that I, I, I did something to bring out hip hop, freestyle, you know, with my promotions. I mean, I entertained thousands, thousands of people per night. So that's more than what, I, you know, a lot of other people could say, and I'm really proud of that. USA it was a roller skating rink that was in Queens that uh, opened a lot of doors for me, and I was the first one to bring in New Edition when they just came out of Boston with Candy Girl, and uh, we were the first ones to bring in Run DMC, all those local groups and stuff like that. I would say M. Morton Hall was the biggest promoter. M. Morton Hall was one of the giants of all times. I've been involved in music for, uh, I would say, approximately 40 years or more. The first party that I did was in 1959, 58-59. We have multiple personalities, especially black folks. And uh, I find myself, at times, in the background. It's the part that I've much preferred during the course of my life, rather than being in front of a camera or whatever. One of the first promoters that used to book flowers for parties. I don't think there's any other promoter in the city of New York that has done the four boroughs. Right. I did parties in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and here in the Browns and Stardust. We I was one of the owner of the ruling class. Also had another club on Merrick Boulevard, further down, okay. where the Delphonics performed the moments before they became Ray Goodman and Brown, wow. et cetera, cooling the gang. 
blah, blah, blah. As the DJs refined their work to impress the crowd, the culture of hip-hop was born and took shape. The founding fathers all participated in the evolving culture until this very day grows. No disrespect to any of the masters of who mastered this business and has been in this business. There were no cool herbs. African Barbados, they weren't around when I was talking. They're late. They're about four years too late. When I went to the Bronx, the Bronx was like out of reach. You know what I'm saying? Uh, wasn't nobody doing nothing in the Bronx. Uh, this is, what, 73, 74? Wasn't nobody doing nothing in the Bronx. We was doing our thing before shit popped off. And we got the flyers and the records and the posters from back then to prove it. We was in Autobahn Ballroom uptown. We was in the Hotel Diplomat. We was in the Renaissance. We was there. Cypher Sound and Finney Machine was right there. A lot of times, those niggas didn't really even have sound systems. They had the piece together shit that I was talking about. All cool DJs had nice sets, yo. And that's not taking nothing away from uptown. It was nice, the house speakers, and y'all did your things, and the crews, and all that. But, uh, Hey, baby, <laughs> you know, don't see, you know, act like you know. Uptown, for our systems, I ain't hear about none of that until after all that. We, far as Brooklyn and Queens was the king of the systems. Queens has its own unique history pertaining to hip hop and that whole DJ MC thing. And, and very often it's been uh, said and using different types of metaphors about how, you know, we started this and we started that. I didn't know nothing about none of those cats uptown. Every, every person I knew about back in the days outside of the twins was DJ Hollywood, was Eddie Cheap. I'm not gonna argue the point. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that these guys took it to another level. Okay, good. Took it to another level. But the idea, I can't give them the idea. I used to spend in the Constellation Ballroom on Thursday night. I used I let, I let Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five in free. On, on my guest list, because no one didn't give a fuck who they was. Run with the game is called hip hop. Uh, don't want to include me in that for the simple fact they say I'm disco. Disco wasn't even in, invented when I started playing music. If I'm disco, a whole piece of my history is still missing. I believe it came from many different places. It didn't just start here. It started in the story. It started in Queens. It started in the Bronx. It started in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Everybody had their own spin on it. It's hard to say who started what because hip hop was a development. It, it, it developed and it evolved around certain things and it became better. Just like how you look at these young kids playing basketball out here. You didn't see a 15-year-old boy dunking the ball back in the 70s and 80s, but now everybody dunking. So what it was, it was just practice and it just developing the certain things. And it's just that the camera was there in different locations in the Bronx of Manhattan and they got the shot to say it. But it's like Christopher Columbus. He didn't discover America. When they came to Queens, we was already doing it. There are things that say hip hop has a culture. Hip hop is based on like five different elements that make hip hop hip hop. And I'm like a little myth with that because of all the elements they say about hip hop, my only contribution to hip hop has been the spoken word. There's hip hop fashion, there's hip hop graffiti. Throughout all of those elements of hip hop, if it was just graffiti, or if it was just fashion, where would hip-hop be? If it was just people dancing, where would it be? Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but if it wasn't for the spoken word, chances of this being as large and as satisfying and as dear to people, I don't think that this would go two blocks as opposed to going around the globe, around the world. When people see Michael Jordan and they say, he's the greatest player ever, they're almost right. And anybody would say, well, 
Yeah, because Dr. J was before Mike and he changed the way this game is and they would be almost right. But there's a guy named Connie Hawkins that most people don't know. That this whirling dervish game that Michael Jordan now holds the platform for started with him. And a lot of people don't know beginnings of mostly anything. Usually the inventor of whatever it is never gets the chance to get the shine out of it. And they never get to see the money that's generated behind it. Whenever they want to speak on hip hop in any shape, form, or fashion, if it don't start with me, that's a story you're watching that left out the meat of the story, that's all. You understand? They bypassed the beginning of that story and went to the next phase. Once upon a time, girl.